Brothers and sisters, happy Sunday. We say happy Sunday because in our tradition, every Sunday is a little Easter. And so it's a cause for celebration. I hope that you have Sunday uh, celebrations, the Sunday rituals that you do. Uh, Sunday is supposed to be a little holiday every single week. When I was growing up, we used to have a big family supper on Sunday at my grandma's house. That was what we did. Uh, but never forget that. For us, every Sunday is a holiday. That's why I say happy Sunday. All right, friends, let us pray. Eternal God, you are our guide and our destination. Lead us into the presence of our shepherd this morning. Amen. My sainted father, uh, he passed away, my first dad, I should say, my sainted father, he passed away when I was 22. Uh, he was 56. Uh, his name was Rusty. He was a lawyer and a scholar and a military guy. And he had strong ideas about the world. But he felt, for Rusty, he felt that it was important that I be aware of my surroundings and engaged in the natural world. He would constantly remind me and teach me that humans are animals as well. And he taught me how to forage in the woods, swamps, fields around our little house, find stuff to eat. Um, now, we had plenty of food growing up. <laughs> we, it wasn't like we were like the hard scrabble pioneer folk, you know. Um, I certainly have never missed a meal. Um, but it was important to him that I understood that food, especially the food in the grocery store, came from someplace else. And, and even beyond that, that farming wasn't the first step toward cultivating food. Somewhere far back in the unwritten past, someone had taken the first step toward collecting the things around them that were good for eating and uh, training them toward becoming the foods that we eat today. So I grew up eating all kinds of stuff I found in the woods. Uh, and even a few critters. You know, when I was preaching down in Tennessee, then I talked about the various ways to barbecue a woodchuck. And I would get nods of approval from the folk around there. And up here in Yankee country, y'all don't know the, the value of a healthy marmot. A good-sized good woodchuck will feed a family of five. So, y'all don't even eat frogs up here. A lot of good frog legs just going to waste out in the woods. Right. Um, as a kid, well, we, as a, when I was a child, we were discouraged from harvesting the woodland creatures. But we were taught how to find and eat fruits and vegetables out in the woods. This was uh, only a few miles south of here. So I know that what I'm talking about, this isn't alien to y'all, but we had the staples, of course, blackberries and mulberries, Hickory nuts. I invested hundreds of hours in cracking hickory nuts. It's time I'll never get back. But we also gathered up the maple seeds, fairy potatoes, squirrel corn, wintergreen berries, autumn olives, and my favorite, wild carrots. Wild carrots. Wild carrots are a particularly useful plant to know because you can eat them in the spring, summer, and the fall. Uh, in the springtime, when the plant is small and it's sort of bright green colored on the soil, you can eat the roots and the stems of the plant. This is the wild carrot is the ancestor of the bright orange genetically modified carrots that we see in grocery stores. And in the summer and the fall, the plant puts out these beautiful fragrant leaves and flowers. And most people around here I found know the wild carrot by its uh, beautiful white flower. They call it Queen Anne's Lace. The flower heads, you can saute those in butter, and they taste like little carrot-flavored cakes. They're good. It's got a lot going for it, but there's a problem with the wild carrot. Uh, the problem with harvesting wild carrots is that to the untrained eye, a wild carrot is almost indistinguishable from another plant, a plant with the scientific name Conium maculatum, commonly known as poison hemlock. You eat a few leaves of poison hemlock, and 
the words of my sainted Allegan County grandma, you're going to be dead before you have a chance to take a nap. This is the same plant that killed Socrates. You don't want to eat hemlock. So how do you know the difference between the two? Well, you've got to learn a few tricks. In Boy Scouts, we were taught the phrase, uh, the queen has hairy legs. Very funny. But in other words, the stem of a wild carrot, they're hairy. Uh, and hemlock stems are smooth. And the queen, Queen Anne's Lace, has got a crown, and the flowers of the wild carrots are these green crowns of pointed leaves. And the queen, uh, the wild carrot's got a small red bud in the center of the flower. And so there's, there's tricks you can do to learn the difference. But it's important to learn the difference. It's especially important to learn the difference if you keep livestock. Because a goat won't know the difference between a hemlock and a carrot. Well, Jesus isn't talking today about goats. He's talking about sheep. And he's talking about shepherds and thieves. And he's trying to warn his disciples to watch out for thieves. You know them, he says. Because they come up over the side of the fence. They jump over the fence instead of coming through the gate. And then he says at the end, most importantly, I think, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly, abundantly. There's the two, two options he presents us with. Theft, death, destruction, or life in abundance. That's a terrifying proposal when you consider that you only get one life to live. But if you give it time to sink in, it becomes a little clearer. Especially for those of us who, who make an honest effort to practice our faith every day. There really are kind of two ways of living in this world, I think. Devotion uh, to the material components of the world. Or devotion to the spiritual components of the world. Uh, John Calvin wrote, and I am fond of quoting this all the time, John Calvin said, the human heart is a factory of idols. Right? The human heart's a, it's like a little factory that's just churning out idols, false idols, things of worship that aren't God. From moment to moment, we come up with the th things to worship. Um, now, right now, I think in our culture, more than anything else, it feels like federal politics is occupying a central place in the throne of the American soul. I don't want to dissuade any of you from paying attention to civics, whatever, but you, you, you really need to keep that stuff away from your faith identity. Uh, you got to beat it back with a stick if needed. I let my faith guide me toward the wild carrots of the world and away from the hemlock. Recently there was an attempt, uh, and they're going to keep trying, they're trying to repeal the Johnson Amendment. The Johnson Amendment. Some of you know what this is, but it's a law that prohibits churches from endorsing political candidates or political parties. That's why we're not supposed to do that. The IRS has never enforced the Johnson Amendment, not once in its history. Uh, but uh, it was a trade-off, and there was some business in there about taxes and things like that, too. But the Johnson Amendment was just trying to keep us honest to our discipline of the, of the First Amendment, right? not to enforce faith or faith identity. Um, it's, it's a kind of a murky business. I don't want to get lost in the wild hemlock on this. I don't know if they're ever going to succeed in repealing that. But I do know that if they do succeed, it's going to take us one more hard step toward a real civil religion in this country, a real American form of Christianity that'll be enforced by the state. I don't want that. Our American historic practice is about freedom of conscience, freedom of and from religion. Every American should be free to make up their own mind. When we wander into those weeds and the hemlock flowers start to look a lot like wild carrots, thief comes over the fence they don't come through the gate. I like to say in plain words, the p politicians jump into the pulpit. They don't come up through their baptism. 
The church becomes another political weapon in this sort of ongoing class struggle in America. A, a brilliant colleague of mine, the Reverend Emily Brown, uh, is one of the pastors of Broadway United Church of Christ in Manhattan. Uh, Emily said in response to this business with the Johnson Amendment, quote, I don't need to tell people how to vote from the pulpit. I have a whole Bible full of scripture that says to heal the sick, welcome the immigrant, to care for the poor, and a congregation full of people who want to follow Jesus. That last line, a congregation full of people who want to follow Jesus, that gives me profound hope for our future. We have these, um, these wild carrots and hemlock. Hard to tell the difference. It takes a lot of uh, practice. A lot of the times, the things that we worship, um, that they feel a lot like worshiping God, and yet there's still idolatry. The hardest forms of idolatry to avoid are the ones that are closest to, to, to God, in my opinion. Um, they look like carrots, and they kill like hemlock. There's three that come immediately to mind. The first is um, worshiping the Bible instead of worshiping God. Uh, the Bible is a important. The Bible is the doorway to our faith. But you don't mistake the doorway for the thing itself. It's a famous Zen Buddhist story. The Buddha has his disciples with him on a mountaintop and he's trying to show them the moon. And he's pointing to the moon and all of his followers are staring at his finger instead of the moon. Don't mistake the finger for the moon. This points the way, but this is not the thing that we worship. Uh, that's not a big deal. That doesn't happen a lot in our tradition in the UCC, mainly because in our traditions we get the poor clergy folk have to just beg and plead with people to actually read their Bibles. <laughs> but there are folks out there in the world who worship the word uh, over the spirit. Don't do that. That, that way leads to death. The second one that comes to mind is worshiping the church instead of worshiping God. Now this one gets a little bit closer to, to, to us, I think. Not so much here at St. John's, but I've served churches where the people worshiped the building or they worshiped the history of their church instead of worshiping God. Um, so uh, that... I think it's because worshiping God makes us feel really vulnerable sometimes. And you worship the church, the physical structure or the political structure, the history, um, that feels safer. But it's not. The church building is a tool. The church's polity is just a strategy. It's an idea. And all of it works together to lead us towards God's vision for our community and our lives. Um, imagining a, a, a carpenter uh, who is able to build beautiful furniture and he has these incredible tools that he's saved up money to purchase and there they sit pristine on the wall of his workshop unused because he takes such good care of his tools that he never uses them to actually build something. Don't let that be the church. It's here to do something. A ship is safe in harbor, but that's not what ships are built for. Okay. Finally, one that came to mind when I was thinking about this is, is worshiping the pastor instead of worshiping God. Well, I don't have a whole lot to say about that. <laughs> but it does happen, though. It happens. You, you see these celebrity pastors on TV and flying around in their jet planes and living in their big old mansions and stuff. I think anybody with a lick of sense, realizes that these fellows have missed the Jesus message by about a country mile. But it happens out there. Um, the worship of a pastor uh, in, instead of the worship of God uh, is a very, very dangerous and dark path to go down. Celebrity pastors do a great deal of harm uh, to churches. Even here, we all were watching the sort of stunning fall of, of, of Bill Hybels pastors these huge churches and um, it's easy to lay the blame at their feet but by doing so we forget that clergy are human beings They're simply human beings trying to work out their faith um, when you get ready uh, you're out there in the world you're going to take a bite out of that wild carrot take a pause 
and say, what am I worshiping? What is, what is the focus of my worship? Am I listening to Jesus? Or am I uh, listening to somebody who jumped over the fence? What would my shepherd have me do? Poison hemlocks, money, fame, recognition, defensiveness, pride. These are a poison to us. Don't worship that stuff. You're allowed to worry about it. Would that I could get you to listen to Jesus and simply stop worrying. I've never succeeded in that. But don't let it become the object of your worship. Generosity, gentleness, goodness, joy, kindness, love, modesty, patience, peace, self-control. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. Those are the good fruits that we cultivate in our hearts when we worship God that will nourish us and lead us into what? An abundant life. An abundant life. The flip side of that coin is a life of scarcity. And the way that we've set things up, especially in America, is to try to convince you that you live in a world of scarcity, that there isn't enough to go around, that it's a dog-eat-dog world. That's such a crazy phrase. The Romans came up with that phrase, dog-eat-dog, and it meant the opposite when they said it, because dogs don't eat dogs. It's not a dog-eat-dog world. Dogs take care of other dogs. (laughs) But the world that Jesus is trying to Explain to us that the, that the wool's been pulled over our eyes. The world is actually a place of deep and profound abundance. And by waking up to this, you will have abundance. Now, does that mean that you're going to be rich and they won't suffer or experience the sort of things that Brother Paul was, was telling about, us about in the, in the, in the reading today that, that, that Sue shared with us? No, it's good. There's, there's, there's rough spots out there, but you have enough. You're going to have enough. And God set this thing up so that we would have enough. Otherwise, God wouldn't have called it good. I think that if you can figure out what you're worshiping, if it's something other than God, because we all do it, if you can figure out what you're worshiping that isn't God, you're going to figure out what's at the root of the anxiety and defensiveness that you might be feeling in your life. You're going to figure out what the root of that hemlock is that's making you sick, that's poisoning you. If you can figure out what the idols are in your life, you can sort out what it is that's, that's, that's harming you. And then you can you know, stop munching on that plant and reorient yourself back toward the only, the only good thing that we can worship, which is God. Now, thankfully, we have a shepherd. And he is always calling for us. Always. He's searching for us. His voice is out there. It's calling. Sometimes we have to get real quiet to hear it. But he's always calling us. And he is calling us through the gate that leads, as he says, into an abundant life. So follow his voice and follow where it leads. Amen. Amen.